Perfect. All right, guys. Um, thanks for hanging out. And um, uh, it's been about two weeks since the beginning of the semester. We're working on all kinds of things. But uh, I do exist, by the way. So it's not just uh, you know, the, uh, kind of a, a fake figure on the uh, video. So the, um, uh, this time is the first time we're streaming down to Champagne. And so the, hopefully everything is working uh, OK from that end. Um, so uh, we're going to continue our lecture. And um, uh, we're going to, uh, in fact, I just realized that we didn't quite finish the uh, lecture from last time. So I'm going to just quickly finish up the um, tiling lecture, and then we go into the DRAM bandwidth. Okay. So there's a real possibility after the lecture that, uh, today, the Chicago students may just say, hey, you know what, don't ever come up again. Just use the, the, the streaming video. You know, it actually works better. So uh, after the lecture, we're going to have a little town hall, and then we, we'll discuss a few things and just make sure that uh, I understand where you are. And uh, so if that's one of the suggestions, um, you know, then I would be happy not to drive through the traffic on uh, Thursdays. OK, so um, we were here uh, at the, uh, the device query stage. So we talk about the use of shared memory. Okay? And the shared memory is really the main mechanism for us to overcome the uh, DRAM bandwidth problem. Okay? So uh, but then uh, one of the questions is, when you use these GPUs, these GPUs can be from many generations. And um, so you know, when, uh, when you go, to, uh, go on to Amazon and try to get a GPU instance, you're going to see you know, Fermi, Kepler, Maxwell, and uh, uh, Pascal, and now uh, Voda. So the question is, uh, how do I find out which GPU I'm using, and then how do I you know, use the right amount of you know, shared memory, and so on. So um, this is what the device query is. And in fact, you have already done this. Right? For MP0, you actually did a, de a device query. So you actually have that piece of code. So the, now it's time to, you know, to, for you to really understand what device query is giving you. The device query uh, has two parts. One is to figure out the number of devices in the system. A lot of uh, you know, the systems have multiple GPUs. Um, the most obvious case is that uh, the GPU, you know, there two or four GPUs for machine learning nodes and so on these days. You know, it's very, very common. And the second one is sometimes you actually can have a small GPU, a very small GPU that comes with your CPU. And that GPU actually does very, very little. It's, it's only for a default display. And these GPUs may be capable of executing CUDA code, but they're not that great. So you want to make sure that you choose the right device if you have multiple GPUs, OK? So, the, so that's why you, did, you get a device count in, that first, in this first uh, query, CUDA get device count. And then uh, you need to uh, give it a in, uh, pointer to an integer variable that you declared in your code. And then uh, you, the, this function will return by depositing that value into the uh, device count variable. You can declare it to whatever you want, and then uh, you know, send it to the function. It will come back with a number. And then you can um, you, uh, declare a CUDA device property. And uh, this is actually a CUDA specific uh, data type. So you need to use the CUDA header file to be able to, you know, to, to uh, in your code, to be able to use this data type. And then uh, you can declare a variable of the name you choose. But um, this name will be, uh, this variable will be used in a for loop that goes through all the GPUs, okay, all the, uh, the devices in your system. And then for each device, um, you, know, you, you can call CUDA get device properties. And then uh, you know, send in that, uh, the pointer to the variable and the number i, which is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the iterative uh, variable, the, uh, the iteration variable in your for loop. So in that, after that statement, you can go into uh, device property. So you can say device uh, the def underscore prop. This is the variable that you have. Dot device property at, mat, uh, at dot max threads per block. Now this gives you the maximum number of threads per block. And for almost all the GPUs that you can see today, it should be 1,024. Okay, that's per block. And then you have device property shear memory per block. 
So this is the maximum of shared memory that you can use per thread block. And for most of the recent GPUs, it should be 48K, 48K bytes. If, if it's not 48K bytes, it's an older GPU. And uh, in some of the older GPUs, you may be able to use you know, smaller number, but um, you should, should be seeing um, you know, 48K bytes uh, for most of the GPUs that you, uh, you have in the uh, Amazon Cloud or in any of the you know, machines that you will be using for this course. And remember, the shear memory per block is not shear memory per multiprocessor, okay? Streaming multiprocessors can take multiple thread blocks, right? And um, uh, so the streaming multiprocessors uh, in today's generations take either 48K bytes or 64K bytes. If you're using Pascal, uh, you know, Maxwell or Pascal uh, and later, uh, they should be able to take 40, uh, up to 64K bytes uh, of shear memory usage. So um, you know, that, that's where you use for occupancy, but then uh, per block is when you write your code, you really cannot use more than 48K bytes per block and hope to get even more than uh, one or more thread blocks into the SM. So, okay, so that gives you the kind of the background for you know, writing a tile code, okay? And also, when you write the code, if you want to find out the kind of hardware they're using and uh, how much shear memory can you use per thread block, and you know, that, uh, that was a device query. Any questions? If not, then we go into the, um, the real topic for today. So we briefly mentioned Okay, briefly mentioned uh, the memory bandwidth. Okay, so um, you know we talk about a simple, basic matrix multiplication code, and that gave us you know somewhere around 25 giga, uh, you know gig, uh, gigaflops per second for a uh, Fermi slash Kepler generation GPU, and um, you will probably see for the most recent GPUs, you know like Pascal. Uh, we're getting about 768 gigabyte per second. It, the main reason for that big jump from 150 to 768 is because of a technology called high bandwidth memory, HBM. And this is a DRAM technology that uh, is integrated with the GPU, and uh, it gives you a lot more pins, and that gives you the bandwidth. But this is a one-time deal. Okay, one-time deal. That we're not going to get that kind of jump um, in the foreseeable future. HBM that we use today is called HBM2, and um, it has a capacity of 16 gigabyte per second. And um, you're not going to see that in your uh, in the GPUs that you're using in the lab because that uh, that is only available on the uh, Pascal generation and uh, uh, later. And so we're not going to be able to see. Um, that kind of bandwidth in the labs that you're using. However, um, you know, we do have those chip, uh, you know, chips available in some of the, you know, so uh, we, we're probably going to make some of the high bandwidth uh, you know, chips available to you if you're interested in experimenting with some of the very high bandwidth memories. But even with 768 gigabyte per second, if you calculate the number of operands that you can, you, you can get, you're still not going to get any more than about 10% of your you know, chip's uh, compute capability if you don't use tiling techniques. Okay, so the matrix multiplication code, the, the basic code that you wrote, will not be able to do much more than 10% of your peak unless you do uh, you know, uh, tiling. On the other hand, um, even though we keep beating on the fact that uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of DRAM bandwidth, I also wanted to make sure that everyone understands the fundamental reasons why we have limited DRAM bandwidth and the fact that we're not dealing with some incompetent design that uh, gave us not enough DRAM bandwidth. In fact, we're dealing with, or we're actually using probably the most competent DRAM uh, system design, and that gave us the bandwidth that we now uh, have accessible uh, to the programmers. So this is the picture, right? The picture that you know, I wanted you to remember. It's not the reservoir that has the water gushing out. It's really a you know, glass of drink that when you're really thirsty and then you're trying to sip as much 
liquid as possible through the narrow straw. So to understand DRAM, you actually need to understand a few things. So I'm going to uh, talk about burst, banks, and channels. Okay, and you, once you start to do uh, you know programming both on the CPU and GPU at a high performance level, you're going to be hearing these kind of things, you know, at, um, and you're going to be seeing some of these things posted on the uh, you know forums. So unless you really understand where they come from, you really will not fully understand what this discussion is, and you will not be able to really be, you know sort of performance debug your code uh, when you have uh, memory bandwidth problems. So this is a, a very simple uh, you know, uh, depiction of DRAM. And the um, uh, DRAM that you see in your system are organized usually into DIMMs. Okay? So you can buy these DRAM DIMMs you know, and put into your system. And um, uh, so these DRAM DIMMs contain a large number of chips, okay? a, lot of, uh, a large number of chips. So uh, within each chip, it roughly looks like this. So you have a core array. You have a core array here. And um, for a one uh, megabit DRAM chip, um, you will have about 1K to 1K. So you, you have a 1, 1K in one direction, 1K in the, the other direction, and it gives you one meg. And um, uh, as the chips get denser, you will have you know, a higher uh, number of uh, uh, bits. So you can easily have a four meg, for example, which will be 2K by 2K, right? So uh, these chips tend to be um, square because that's the, uh, the way that you can manufacture chips in the mo most efficient way. If you manufacture chip in a, into a long rectangle, uh, the chips can break more easily, so that you'll know, have less yield. So when we have 1K by 1K, um, we need to organize the DRAM into these rows. You know, so we have 1,000 rows, and then we have 1,000 columns, and that uh, you know, the event, so we need to give the row address to select one of the rows, okay? And then we have the, uh, you know, the, the address, the column address to select from the thousand bits that come out of the row, you know, um, further select the bits that uh, satisfy our need. So a, a simple way to look at it is that, um, you know, you, you can have a situation where you're trying to uh, access, let's say, uh, if I want to access four bytes. Four bytes is only 16 bits. So that's why you know, you're going to need to select the 16 bits out of the 1,024 bits that will come out of each row. So this is why you need to have the column address to multiply a subset of the bits that, can come out of the, that came out of the core array. So, the, so the, whenever you have a row address and um, you start to access the core array, and these sense and amplifiers are what I call the modern miracles. Okay, these sense amplifiers uh, can sense an extremely small amount of uh, voltage that appear on these on the wires leading into the sense amplifiers, and then they determine whether the row that you are accessing stores ones or zeros in each cell. So each cell comes out as a line. <coughs> so here's a very simple example. Um, you know what? The, let's say if we have a 16-bit um, you know, array. Okay, this is a very very small array, just so that you you know, you you really you know see what's going on. And uh, let's say uh, we're trying to access two-bit you know words. You know, this is a hypothetical, right? Two-bit words out of the six you know 16-bit array. And um, so we organize uh, the memory system. If we have a word size of two bits per word. Then the 16 bits give us eight words, right? Eight words. So, uh, so we're going to get the word address here, which is you know zero. Let's say we want to have word three, okay, out of the 16. So the row address gives us zero one one, and then we we take zero and one as the row address. So this gives us the row address, and it, it give it will select one of the four uh, rows. Right, and each row will have two words in there. So, so zero one gives us this row here, row zero one, and the decoder enable it, and then um, the so the cells will start to drive the bit line, and the bit line will be sensed, and then it will give us four the contents of four cells, and then we use this 
the significant bit as the column address to select one of the uh, you know one of the two uh, you know words out of the column, the, uh, out of the row. So then uh, we select in this case uh, you know the one bit will select these two bits, and then uh, we give you know uh, these two in the output. So here is the fundamental problem um, you know, when we build these technologies. The DRAMs are built for capacity. Okay? The chip, uh, these uh, DRAM manufacturers, whether they are Micron in the US, whether they're Samsung in Korea, they all um, are competing for building bigger and bigger DRAM chips. Because when Apple sells you cell phones, okay, they would, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they would charge you for, you know, the amount of DRAMs you have. You know, when you have laptops, you know, you can have, you know, 16 gigabits uh, bytes per second, 8 gigabytes per second. It makes a big difference in terms of the price you pay, and it makes a difference to the manufacturers like Apple and, uh, you know, the, uh, Lenovo. You know, if they can have bigger and bigger DRAM, they can charge you more money and they can make more money. So these DRAMs are built to be as you know, big a capacity as possible, which means that they're making the cells as small as possible. So these cells are actually built with single transistor. Every cell is just a single transistor. And the information storage that you put into the cells are stored as just a little bit of charge in the what we call the parasitic capacitance of the transistor. So you're really just trapping a little bit of the charge in the transistor's uh, you know, parasitic capacitance. And then whenever you enable the transistor, you select the, uh, the word line. So all these uh, you know, transistors on that line will be enabled. So the charge will come out. Okay, the charge will come out, out of the capacitance and then go into this, this, word, uh, this bit line. There, in our example, if we have 1,000 by 1,000, the bit line will be connected to 1,000 of these transistors. So the bit line has a huge capacitance. Okay, the bit line is you know, very, very capacitive compared to the parasitic capacitance that you have. So with, this is what we call the charge sharing phenomena. You have a small capacitance, you have a big capacitance, you connect them together, the charge will come out, and the, the large capacitor's voltage will be raised just a tiny little bit, okay, a tiny little bit. So um, the kind of analogy that I always use is that uh, in the old days, you know, I used to go to uh, Texas Instrument for, you know, with, uh, consulting for their DSP division. And then, uh, so they have these Texas buildings. You know, I, I don't know if some of you have, you know, have been to Texas Instrument for, in, uh, for internship. So these buildings you know, have almost like a mile long these are buildings are like mile long buildings, okay? And then uh, they have all these office face that have a main ha a hallway that you can, you know, you, use, you need to use a binocular to, to see the other end of the, the hallway. So then you have all these offices, you know, uh, you know uh, coming, uh, come to, uh, you know, with doors to the hallway. So basically what we're saying is you get this person at the end, you know, somewhere on the hallway to come out with a cup of coffee, okay, with a cup of coffee. And then, as soon as the coffee hits the, the hallway, there's some molecules of you know the uh, the aroma of the coffee that will come you know come, come into the hallway. You stand on the other side of the hallway, you start to smell, you know, and say you know then someone asks you what's the flavor of the coffee that the person is holding. Okay, that's really what it is. Okay, so you have very tiny amount of you know molecules kind of traveling and then you know start to fill the hallway. And then uh, you, you try to sense you know, what, the, what, what it is. So here you have a very tiny amount of charge that is you know, being uh, the sheared into this line. And the sense amplifier at the end is trying to decide whether it's one or zero. And this is an extremely slow process. And the modern miracle makes it into a somewhere around a few, uh, you know, so somewhere around 500 clock cycle, which means that it's, you know, it's a sub uh, you know, it's a sub-microsecond sensing, you know, the, in, uh, of this thing. And then so it's, it's actually pretty, you know, fast compared, you know, relative to the things that we're asking it to do. So that's why, um, you know, it takes a long, long time. 
to be able to determine, you know, the, uh, determine what that cell is, uh, is holding. So as far as the GPU is concerned, the GPU says, I want to have a piece of data, okay? So the GPU sends the address over to the memory. And you go through some kind of decoder chain, and eventually you hit this chip. This chip is supposed to have that data. And then you enable that line, and you wait for that sense amplifier to, you know, to figure out what it is. And then eventually the sense amplifier figure it out and you know, give you that information. So if you look at the core speed of these, you know, the, of these things, the core speed is the speed at which the sense amplifier can determine, okay, can determine what the cell is holding compared to the interface speed. The interface is the, uh, the, the, uh, the lines that go to the controller that can actually pump the, uh, the bits into the GPU. If you look at the, uh, the speed ratio for the original DDR, the, in, the interface, the, uh, the core is half the speed of the interface. That is, the interface runs at a clock that is um, twice the interface, uh, the, twice the speed of the core clock. And then DDR2, it becomes one quarter, and DDR3, it became one eighth. So what we're seeing is the cores are getting slower and slower compared to the interface. The reality is not that the, the cores are getting slower and slower, um, absolutely. It's because the interface is getting faster and faster. The interface has been, become faster because we want more and more memory bandwidth, right? So, but the cores cannot keep up. The cores are really becoming bigger and bigger, but not any faster. So that's why the ratio has become uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the ratio has become smaller and smaller. So it will likely be worse in the future because we're still hungry for more memory capacity, okay? Our, D, our laptops are still, you know, hungry for more memory because we're using more and more apps. Our cell phones are hungry for more and more uh, memory capacity because if you look at, if you just go and do a double click on your button on iPhone, you will realize you actually have a huge number of apps simultaneously still active, okay? And those are the things that consume uh, more DRAM. Now, so uh, the, the problem is every time we get a piece of information out of, the, uh, of a DRAM, it takes a long time. So the, the, the standard way of you know, overcoming this problem is that since it takes a long time for you to get any information out of that device, every time you go, you try to get a lot of information out of it. Okay, so instead of you know, the, the accessing just one word, every time you go to the DRAM, you access multiple words. And what happens is that um, in, the, in our simple example, a small example here, um, even though we're only accessing, let's say, zero, one, zero, word 010, zero, zero, so we really only wanted to have you know, uh, uh, two bits out of this device, but since it takes so long, we will just go ahead and take another two bits out of it. And so we would access the row here, we access the row, and then um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we take the, uh, the first uh, two bits, and then we pump the, the next two bits we pump the next two bits out, you know, as part of this action. So every time we access a number of bits, we actually end up getting a bigger number of bits, and this is called a burst, okay? This is like a machine gun, you know, you, go, you pull the trigger, you know, more and more bullets, come, a lot of bullets come out, right? So that's the original reason why they call it burst, okay? So this uh, mechanism allows you to ask for a you know, piece of data, and in modern DRAM systems, the burst is usually about 64 bytes, okay? And um, in some of the memory systems, it has become 180 bytes, uh, 28 bytes. And so every time you want to have a word, you're gonna get 64 bytes out of it, okay? Which means 16 words, okay? So, so that's why, um, you know, we never really, uh, you know, uh, do the access, you know, uh, with one word. If you look at the kind of the bursting timing of the uh, system, if we don't have uh, bursting, let's say if we, if we need to access consecutive words, okay, consecutive words in the memory system. So we're trying to go down a continuous locations, okay, of the, the memory. 
If we didn't use bursting, then uh, we'll do access, and then the data will come out, and then we'll, go and we'll do another access, the data will come out. So this gives us extremely, extremely low throughput in accessing data, because the data, uh, the, the distance between, the time between the consecutive locations that can come out of the DRAM is the latency of your access. If we use bursting, then the byte, uh, the next word will come out right away because we're just uh, clicking them out of the uh, out of the sense amplified buffer. And so if we are accessing consecutive locations, if we're accessing consecutive locations, the second one will be much, much faster, right? So we eliminated that second wait time. But there's a big assumption here, right? The big assumption is we're accessing what? Consecutive locations. So this leads to the concept of, the, of memory coalescing. This is the fundamental reason why we're going to be using memory coalescing in our code. In CPU, it actually has a different thing. It has to do with the cache line design, okay? But for GPUs, we're, uh, we're going to be you know, seeing the, the effect of this design as in terms of memory coalescing. It's not the end of the story. It, um, so the reason why we have all these multiple DRAM banks and multiple DRAM chips in the DIMM is because we need to be able to have, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of, uh, you know, we need to be able to have more access parallelism, okay, in order to fully utilize the, uh, the, the, uh, the interface or the uh, channels that we have from delivering data from DRAM to the CPU. If we look at the, the timing data here, so essentially what we have is we have a long delay and then we have a burst, right? We have a burst to the CPU. But if we want to access another burst, it will be another long delay, right? It will be another long delay. So if we only have one chip connected to this interface, we're going to see long, quiet time, and then some burst, and then long, quiet time, some burst. So we're definitely not achieving what the interface is capable of delivering, because the interface is idling for a long time you know, the, between bursts. So that's why we put multiple chips, and, uh, banks and multiple chips on, a, uh, on that interface. And so these are two uh, you know, DRAM banks. And then uh, so we will have another uh, bit in the address to select one of the banks. And so these two banks have their own decoders. So they can be doing the access simultaneously. So this is what modern memory systems do. We have multiple simultaneous accesses all sent to the memory system. And hopefully, some of the, uh, one of the accesses will uh, land on this chip, and one of the accesses will land on this other chip. So you will be decoding in, par uh, you know, the in parallel with each other. And when these you know, the uh, sense amplifiers finish their job, let's say bank one will start to burst uh, while bank uh, zero is still accessing. So then they line up and then they, you know, they, they actually arbitrate for that uh, interface and they you know, start to, uh, to burst uh, you know, whenever uh, the interface become available. So with all this arbitration and arrangement, what happens is hopefully all these banks will begin to have a timing like this. They're going to have you know, uh, bank zero, bank one. And so bank one will be bursting, and then bank zero will come out and burst. So these two will be bursting into the same interface. So now if you look at the interface, we, have see, we see more bursting activities. Fewer, you know, quiet time, right? Less quiet time. And that gives us better utilization. So, you know, let's say if the interface speed is eight times, right? Remember DDR? Uh, you know, the DDR3, DDR4, the core speed is one-eighth, right, of the interface speed. So we need to have a minimum of eight banks to, be, to even have a chance, right, to even have a chance to fully utilize the interface and to, uh, to deliver the bandwidth that memory channel promises to, to deliver. But because we could have bank conflicts, some of the accesses may hit the same bank, and they cannot do the happen in parallel. We typically need to have a large, more than eight banks per interface to be able to get close to fully utilizing 
that channel. So with these uh, um, optimizations and uh, techniques, uh, we can fully utilize a single DRAM channel, okay, with enough of these pending accesses. This is the reason why, you know, we are talking about having a large number of warps. Remember, we, we want to have a large number of warps in each SM because each warp is going to give us a pending memory access. So if we have a large number of warps in each SM, those warps can, it would likely give us these independent memory accesses, and that would hopefully you fully utilize the what the bets. Okay, so that's where you know the uh, sort of uh, that connection comes about. So uh, in a typical GPU today, we have eight or more of those interfaces. Basically, they are called the memory channels. So so this gives us the next level. And we need to make sure that uh, all the channels are also um, you know, uh, uh, fully utilized to be able to get to the 150 gigabyte per second. So a 150 gigabyte per second memory uh, you know, bandwidth is actually typically achieved with eight channels, okay, eight channels. So each channel will give us you know, close to, to 20 gigabyte per second, but then each channel is going to be connected to a large number of chips, right? And these chips, with those, those banks in the chips, will hopefully collectively fully utilize the close to 20 gigabyte per second bandwidth for the interface. So just to be able to get to 150 gigabyte per second, we are actually pulling several stunts, okay? We're really pulling several stunts. We need to get the bursting to work perfectly, right? We need to have the bursting to work perfectly. We need to have enough independent accesses to be able to fully utilize each interface. We need to have even more independent accesses whole, full distributed to different channels or different interfaces to get to that 150 gigabyte per second. So this is the reason why 150 gigabyte per second for a, D, for a DRAM system is not a simple feast. The, G, the CPUs have been operating at about 25 gigabyte per second for a long, long time. And now they're, you know, so then they started to get into about 50 gigabyte per second. And now with the HBM, they're now beginning to, you know, to become comparable to the GPUs. Okay, so, so you know, th these are the kind of things that are really very costly to design. It takes a lot of energy at runtime to be able to access these channels in parallel, and that's why you know these things are not cheap. Okay, so uh, how does that translate? Okay, how does that translate into you know how you look at your code and how you look at your data? So this is where we start to you know to look at um, the sort of how the uh, how the matrix modification behave on a memory system. But before we move on, any question about the DRAM system design? Okay. So, um, and uh, one of the uh, you know one of the things that uh, uh, we're going to see is that uh, remember we have matrix multiplication here. So uh, matrix multiplication you know will have two input matrices and one output matrix. So uh, let's take a look at the M matrix here. Let's use a very small, very uh, very small M matrix. Okay. The small M matrix would uh, have, you know, let's say four by four elements, 16 elements, and we use row major layout, right? The row major layout for C. So we have the first row, the second row, third row, fourth row, or row zero, row one, row two, row three. So the M, so the basically we have M zero zero, M uh, you know zero one, M zero two, M zero three. So this is the the uh, the address for all the 16 elements in the memory space, okay? And these elements are gonna be stored into the DRAM, right? So uh, they're gonna be stored in consecutive locations. <laughs> so when we take a look at the matrix multiplication, um, we see that when we access the M matrix, we use the row times width plus K, right? Row uh, times width time, uh, uh, plus K. So each thread, it's going to pick a row, right? It's going to pick a row in M, and it's going to increment K, so it's going to be doing this. It's going to select one of the rows, right? 
select one of the rows. And let's say it selects this, uh, the, this row here. So it will go into the memory and start with this. And k is going to take it to the elements, right, through that row. OK, so that's the, uh, the n access. The n access is a little bit different. The n access has k times width plus colon. So intuitively, the n access is coming down on a column, right? Coming down in a column. So if we go back to the um, to the layout, we're actually taking one of the columns, right? And then we're going to use k multiplied with so that we can skip over. We can skip over to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So in the memory, what we're really doing is we're starting with this. Oops. We're starting, so if we're starting with row, uh, you know, row we're uh, traveling in row two, what we're doing is we're starting with M02, and then we skip over to M12, and we're skipping over to M22, and we're skipping over to M32. So, so the N, just imagine that that's the N matrix, right? So we're, we're doing this hop over thing for the N axis. Any questions about that? So th those are the two axis patterns that we're going to see for every thread. Every thread is going to be accessing some con continuous locations in a row, and every and it's going to be accessing these hop over kind of patterns for n, right? Correspond to a column. So that gives us this summary. When we have two threads, when we have two threads in, you know, you know, in, in our you know, the matrix multiplication, the threads will be accessing rows horizontally, and then they will be accessing the ends vertically. Okay, vertically. Okay. So k is that loop counter of the inner product loop. So let's take a look at the n axes. Okay, the n axes. The n axes are like this. If we are, uh, we're assigning the neighboring th uh, elements of P to neighboring threads, right? Remember, we're, we're doing this output tile, you know, the partitioning. So every thread block is going to process a small tile of the output, generate a small tile of that output. The neighboring threads in the thread block is going to be accessing, is going to be generating neighboring P elements. Right, so that's how we, we assign the, you know, the, uh, remember the row and column com uh, calculation. So if we have two threads in the thread block that are neighboring, you know, adjacent to each other, and they are in the same warp. Remember, the warps are partitioned into 30, you know, the 32 thread warps for the thread block. So we're taking the first 32 threads, we call it warp zero, right? And then next, so that all the threads in that warp will essentially be neighboring threads, and the neighboring threads will be generating neighboring p elements. When we have neighboring p elements, they are going to be accessing neighboring n columns, okay, and neighboring, you know, n rows, right? In fact, in this case, they're be going to be accessing exactly the identical rows. The neighboring threads in P will be accessing neighboring n columns, but they're going to be coming down on exactly the same row, okay, in the matrix multiplication. So let's take a look at the n axes. This is actually one of the non-intuitive parts of this course, okay? So the threads, thread zero is going to come down column zero and access the n elements. Thread one is going to be coming down column one accessing the n elements. So during the first iteration, thread zero, thread one, thread two, thread three will be accessing n zero zero, n zero, uh, n, uh, uh, zero one, n zero two, and n zero three. So the threads, Neighboring threads are accessing what? Neighboring n elements. Within each thread, the iteration will do the skip over pattern, right? But if you look at all these threads in the warp, inside the warp, 
the neighboring threads are accessing neighboring n elements. So what that means is that they can get their data in one DRAM burst. Right? Remember, these DRAM bursts are adjacent memory contents, right? The, 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 you know, the adjacent memory locations. So this is what we call the memory coalescing mechanism. Whenever the threads in a warp access adjacent memory locations, there's a hardware that detects this and say, we have a good pattern here, okay? All these threads are accessing neighboring locations, so I only need to make one DRAM request, only need to make one DRAM request to the memory system, and the burst comes out, and the burst will contain all these neighboring locations, and that's exactly what the warp wants. Okay, so the warps don't need to trigger multiple DRAM requests into the system. The hardware only generates one out of all the 32 requests, or the 16, sometimes two for you know various reasons. Uh, we can talk about details later. But the hardware coalesces the memory requests from the threads into a very, very small number. One or two, hopefully no more than three, for in the DRAM system. There are lots of uh, alignment issues and so on. But the number will be much, much smaller than the number of threads in the warp. And this reduces the request to the DRAM controller. And this saves the memory bandwidth. Because every burst that the DRAM chip gives us will be fully utilized. Okay, So that's why. For n accesses, we're making very good use of the memory system. Okay, we're actually making full utilization of the DRAM bandwidth. The m accesses are different. Okay, the m accesses are different because um, for the thread within the thread, different iterations will be accessing con consecutive locations. However, if you look at the uh, two different threads, in general, in general, two different threads, they will be actually accessing you know, uh, locations that are away from each other. This is not exactly the behavior of matrix multiplication, the basic matrix multiplication. But you need to understand that um, you know, whenever you have two threads, two neighboring threads going down, going uh, down the, the rows, two different rows. Let's say if you have two neighboring threads going down two neighboring rows of M, then the access pattern is actually uh, thread zero and thread one will be ac 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 uh, accessing locations that are stride away from each other. Okay, So the hardware will see that these threads are not ac accessing consecutive locations. So the hardware cannot do the coalescing, OK? And this is the counterintuitive part of GPU programming. The memory accesses that are being made by different threads are the accesses you see simultaneously. The accesses that you're making out of each thread right, in, in these iterations actually can be very far away from each other in terms of time because of the zero scheduling, okay, zero cost scheduling. So these two accesses of iteration zero and iteration one of the same thread can actually be separated in time by a long, a long time. So those two accesses are not the accesses that happen close to each other in time. What's happening close to each other in time are the accesses by different threads in the same warp, okay? They are the, the, these are the, the, the accesses that will come to the hardware at the same time. This is what trips most of the GPU, uh, CPU programmers when they start to optimize for GPU performance, because the, their intuition is completely uh, turned around in terms of loca time locality. Okay? The threads are where the time localities are, okay? across threads, not within each thread. Okay? And the, the fundamental reason why the GPU pro, uh, CPU programs don't think this way is because CPUs have very long context switching uh, overhead. 
So that's why the CPU threads tend to run for, for a long, long time before you do the contact switch. So the memory accesses by, this sing, by a single CPU thread are the accesses that are close to each other in time. Whereas in GPUs, you have this massive number of threads all active at the same time. You're doing zero contact switch. And in the warps, they're actually executing exactly at the same time. So that's why the time locality has switched around from CPU to GPU, OK? So let's go into the, uh, you know, the, the access patterns. For matrix multiplication, for the basic matrix multiplication code, it's not exactly this pattern. Because all the threads, all the neighboring threads are actually going to be traversing down exactly the same M row. Okay, they will be accessing the same M row, but then multiple N columns. So it's not that they are they're accessing, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, stride away locations. They're accessing exactly the same location. But this still causes inefficiency in VRAM system because all of them are accessing the same location, right? The, 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 exactly the same M location, uh, location. That means that out of all the consecutive data elements that come out of the burst, all of them only want to have one of them, okay? So they will all go to access the next one. So this actually still underutilizes the memory system. And it's still not, a, even though they're all accessing the same location, it's still not fully utilizing the memory bandwidth. So this is the reason why you know, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're not going to get full 37.5 gigabyte uh, gig gigaflops that the memory bandwidth should have allowed us because we're actually underutilizing the DRAM bandwidth when we access the M matrix. Okay, So that's why we went down to about 25. <laughs> gigaflop per second on the real hardware for exactly this reason. So that's why now you, you see that we did a uh, back of the envelope calculation. Okay, we did a, a very quick uh, you know, bang, back of the envelope calculation. We say we have 150 gigabyte per second, okay? Great. And if we divide it by four, that gives you the number of you know, single precision floating point operands. And if they keep, you know, they all come out of the memory system at that rate, then we can uh, do 37.5 gigaflops. But in reality, because the M accesses are not fully utilizing the memory bandwidth, so we actually went down, right? So that's the nuance that you need to understand. Well, now that you understand what mem bursting and memory correlation is, okay? So that mystery gets solved. So how do we, you know, when we use shared memory, we actually, you know, remember I mumbled something about loading pattern. You know, when we load uh, M and N matrices, uh, the you know, in tiles into the shared memory, I talk about the assignment of the loading responsibility, right? So I, I mentioned that uh, when we load an M, uh, an M tile and an N tile, we're going to be using we're going to be using neighboring threads to load the neighboring elements of a row in M and in N. So essentially, we're going to be assigning the, the, the thread to load the, L, the M and N elements in exactly the same relative position that it needs calculation of P. Okay, so this is part of the reason why we designed the input tiles and output tiles to be exactly the same dimension, and you know they have exactly the same shape. They're uh, all squares. So we let's say if we have 16 by 16 tiles, then you know what uh, we're going to be generating 256 p elements, and we're going to be loading 256 m elements and 256 n elements in each. You know, face, right? So the M element that we're going to be loading from, uh, from the uh, global memory by the thread will be in the, exactly the same position as the P element that thread is calculating. Why is that? Because that allows us to have neighboring threads to be loading neighboring M elements, right? This is a very, very important subtlety. The, calc the loading of the M element in the tile algorithm 
makes the access pattern to M and N identical. Identical. And they are both now coalesced. Whereas if you look at a basic matrix multiplication algorithm, the M access pattern and the N access patterns are different. Right? One is horizontal, one is uh, vertical. So this gives us this picture here. We, you know, in order to calculate uh, a P element here, we're going to lo be loading a M tile and an N tile into the shear memory. And so when we load the shear memory, we use the coalesced memory access pattern, okay? And then when we access the shear memory, the shear memory will be accessed in the horizontal pattern for M and the vertical pattern for N. So the access pattern will be still different once the data goes into the shear memory. However, the shear memory is built with fast SRAM bits. Coalescing doesn't matter. Okay, it does, there's no coalescing requirement because it's built with very, very fast memory cells. So that's why we can, you know, confine the horizontal access pattern to the shear memory. And when we load the data from global memory into shear memory, we use the coalesced access pattern. And this fully utilizes, fully utilizes the memory bandwidth when we load the piles. Into, this, uh, into the shared memory. So even without data reuse, we are already making better use of memory bandwidth when we load the data, M data, into the shared memory. Okay? And this is a technique called corner turning. Because if you look at the access pattern of neighboring threads, in the, um, in the, uh, when we load the tiles, we're using the tiles. We're using a neighboring threads accessing neighboring patterns, but then in the shear memory, they're now accessing you know vertical locations now. So the, the neighboring threads are not accessing; they're actually uh, accessing neighboring uh, you know, vertically neighboring locations that are not uh, physically neighboring. So the pattern got turned around from vertical to horizontal when we load the pattern. So. The original access is a horizontal access pattern, um, you know, the, uh, the vertical uh, the horizontal pattern for a threat, but then, uh, you know, in the uh, loading process, we actually turned it around. So this is called corner turning. It's a very commonly used technique. Whenever we have a strided memory access pattern, we load things into the global, uh, into the uh, on-chip memory using a turned around pattern. And then for, for better use of memory um, uh, bandwidth, and then uh, in, inside the on-chip memory, we use the bad access patterns for DRAM, but SRAM doesn't care. So this gives us a much better uh, you know, memory bandwidth. So this gives us the, um, you know, the uh, sort of the, the fundamental uh, understanding of why, how memory coalescing comes about, okay, how memory coalescing comes about, and uh, why um, you want to have neighboring threads in a warp to access neighboring you know, uh, elements. So that's why when we load these tiles from uh, DRAM into shared memory, we, we have the, you know, the, we're, we have the uh, flexibility in assigning which element should be loaded by which thread. So we, we use that flexibility to make sure that the neighboring threads are accessing neighboring elements in M and N. So uh, there's another important subtlety. Remember, we keep cum accumulating the p-value in the register, but eventually we still need to write into the memory, right? We still need to write it back into the memory. So by assigning the neighboring threads in a warp to uh, to write to generate neighboring p elements in the output tile, the write is also coalesced. So the hardware will actually uh, uh, will, uh, will assemble all the writes into a DRAM, you know, the, in, into a burst, and then burst it into the DRAM, you know, for write. So that also gives us a full utilization of write bandwidth. So the write bandwidth is often time you know, uh, kind of uh, people tend not to pay attention to the right bandwidth as much as read bandwidth 
but in practice, the right bandwidth is as important as the read bandwidth. You want to be able to have correlates writes into your output as well. Okay. So any questions about the uh, DRAM bandwidth and so on? Okay, good. So uh, now we can uh, look at uh, kind of charge ahead a little bit. You know what? Uh, in fact, um, uh, I went through this just a little bit faster today. After I drive through the traffic this morning, I um, you know I I think I can you know, run faster on anything. So one thing that um, you know always make me appreciate Champaign Urbana is that uh, every time I have to drive through the Chicago traffic. Um, you know what, I, I, I'm very thankful for the traffic in Champaign. My mother lives in Los Angeles, and um, several times a year I go to Los Angeles to see her. And um, I use it as my training session so that I can still drive in uh, traffic. So this morning, thanks to my mother, I still remember how to drive through uh, traffic. So that, that uh, 94 traffic, you know, but uh, it was actually not bad compared to to, uh, to LA traffic. So if you, if you don't like the Chicago traffic, you know, go to LA sometimes, and you will appreciate Chicago even more. Uh, ah, okay, I need to upload. I forgot that uh, I need to upload the next. So let everyone stretch a little bit. I want to use the time to you know, um, to charge your head just a little bit. So with this uh, lecture, you should be able to fully understand uh, the matrix tile matrix multiplication. Everyone take a two minute break. Yes. Yes, absolutely. They are identical. Yes. And the, and the column has become low, which means it becomes adjacent to non adjacent, right? Yes. Why it's still a correlation? Yeah. Re remember, um, so basically, um, it's about loading the, two, uh, you know, the, um, the tile that you will need to use later on. So that's why, you know, all the, uh, uh, all the threads are actually loading useful elements. If you if if you uh, think about it, so that that's why we're actually spreading out the responsibility of loading, so that now instead of every thread to redundantly access the same element, we're now spreading them out to to load the adjacent elements. 
So it's about getting the, the tile to, into the shared memory as quickly as possible. Yeah, so work out a, uh, you know, a, a, a small example, it should, it should become clear. All right. So, let's see, spring. Hopefully, the upload will work. So hopefully, we have the slides. Perfect. Excellent. So, <laughs> so now that we, you know, we understand the, um, you know, the uh, coalescing aspect of things. And let's go back and you know, look at our tiling code a little bit more carefully to learn how to assess the benefit of tiling and also to learn how to handle boundary conditions in tiled algorithms, okay? So uh, here's the matrix multiplication code. And then, uh, you know, uh, so uh, we're going to be using phased you know, the execution for every thread. So every thread is going to be iterating through this M for loop, and every M is one phase, right? So we go through these phases, and we do the loading of, you know, the, so every thread will load one M element and one N element, and then, uh, you know, we do the sync, uh, you know, the sync threads to make sure that everyone finishes within the thread block, and then everyone go to the shear memory, access data from the shear memory, and we do the uh, sync thread to make sure that everyone finishes consuming the shared memory, right? And then you go back for the next phase. So you know what uh, we went, we saw this slide, and uh, we could use 16 by 16 thread blocks or 32 by 32 thread blocks, and we can calculate for each tile uh, configuration we will use more or less shared memory. And we, you know, we also have the thread block, you know, got, uh, the, the, the side number of, limited number of threads and thread blocks that we can put into the shared memory. If you go through the, uh, the calculation, the number of active threads and therefore the number of active warps will be identical for the, uh, you know, the, the Maxwell architecture. So as far as the parallelism is concerned, we're going to have exactly the same number of warps that we can accommodate in each you know, streaming multiprocessor. So that's fine. The, the bigger difference here is the memory bandwidth reduction. So for 16 by 16 tiling, we can reduce the global memory by a factor of 16. The way to think about it is you have 16 by 16 elements in your shared memory, and you're generating, you're generating 16 by 16 
um, you know, the uh, p elements, right? P elements in your uh, in your output tile. So you're generating 256 p elements, and each p element should be accessing global memory by 16 times. Okay, 16 times 16 and 16 times 2. Okay, so you have you know two uh, a pair in, uh, that you're going to access. And then you're going to need to do 16 of them for this phase. And so that's the original number of accesses you have, 256 times 16 by 16 times 2. But then, uh, because we're using tiling, we only need to access 16 by 16 of n and 16 and 16 of n. If you do the ratio, you will see that you have a 16 times reduction. So that's a very easy way to calculate um, the memory reduction. How many act you know, uh, memory accesses you would have done without the tile in the shared memory. And then how many accesses does it take for you to load the data into shared memory? That ratio will give you the savings factor, right? Because once you save, you put the data into the shared memory, you no longer need to act, uh, do any more uh, global memory accesses. For 32 by 32, if you go through the same uh, calculation, the access is reduced by 32. So the bigger the tile, the more the savings. And uh, someone on uh, the Champagne, uh, the Urbana camp, uh, campus uh, asked this question. In fact, uh, yeah, it was the Urbana campus. It was in DCL. Uh, you know, so, so essentially, uh, you know, we had this problem of you know, not exploiting all the sharing you know, opportunities. Because every matrix element should be used by the size of your dimension, right? So every element should be uh, uh, used by all the elements on, on the uh, you know sort of uh, uh, on the same row or column. So this is exactly the point. The point is, you know, when you have a limited tile, you're going to be only exploiting a subset of the opportunities. And by using bigger tiles, we are essentially using fewer thread blocks. And therefore, we're pulling more of the opportunities into each thread block and have more reduction of memory accesses. Okay. So that's why the tiling algorithms always love to have bigger tiles. Okay. The, more, the bigger the tiles, usually the more the savings. And uh, when we look at convolution, which is the you know the the the, uh, the basis for neural net, uh, we see exactly the same you know phenomena. You when you have bigger tiles, you have more memory savings, but for a slightly different reason. So this one is for matrix modification, and we have literally unlimited you know uh, uh, data reuse, and the amount of uh, savings that we can get is limited by how big we can make these tile dimensions to be. Okay. So we, all, we also look at this query thing. And then so you know what, uh, we, can, you know, we can figure out how much shared memory we have. And then we can get the biggest possible tile size. In this case, you know, um, since we're using, only, um, you know, every, uh, we're using only one thread to handle one, uh, to generate one output element, uh, we're limited by the number of threads that we can have in each thread block. So this is a fundamental reason why, if you look at production matrix multiplication code, they typically have each thread to generate multiple p elements to further increase the tile size. Okay, and um, so um, you know uh, we are going to, uh, if we have enough time, we'll come back and talk about the CUDNN matrix multiplication implementation or QBLAS. Uh, matrix uh, implementation, and you will see how we can you know, play the trick of using each thread to generate multiple p elements to further increase the tile size, and, um, that, and the, therefore further increase the reduction of memory uh, bandwidth consumption. So, but in order for you to you know to really do well in uh, MP uh, MP3, you also need to understand how to handle matrices of arbitrary size. Because the matrices that you'll be using will be, you know, will not be multiples of your block size in each dimension. So you will need to be able to test whether or not, you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the threads 
that you have in each thread block falls within or outside the valid range of these matrices. So the, the tau matrix multiplication kernel in uh, lecture five can handle only the matrices whose dimensions are multiples of the tile dimensions. However, in reality, you know, when you handle these matrices, you cannot assume that these matrices will always come uh, in the multiples of your tile size. And um, uh, one, uh, tra you know, traditionally we have two schools of thought. One is, let's have the code to handle only the multiples of tile sizes, and then we pad the input matrix into the next bigger multiple, okay, of the uh, of the uh, size, so that you know the code will work. And this is called padding, and it's um, you know it can be quite costly to do. But then uh, we take a different approach. We actually use uh, runtime testing. So when you let's say um, you know when we have the small four by four matrix multiplication. Let's say if the matrix is actually three by three, not four by four. Okay. So now, um, in order for us to launch the kernel, we will still end up launching. You know, if the uh, if the tile uh, uh, the tile size is two by two, we will still be launching four thread blocks because we need to have enough threads to cover the three by three. Um, you know, the uh, outputs. So we will still be launching four thread blocks, and then uh, now we see that uh, there are threads in the uh, in, in thread block zero one and thread block one zero and thread block one one that correspond to p elements that don't exist, right? So they uh, they co correspond to the thread. So this was tested in the you know in that big you know uh, if statement outside the uh, the threads. That's okay. However. There's something more subtle. When you when it comes to loading the n and n elements, the threads that are uh, that correspond to the you know the uh, the parts that are outside the range may actually have to still participate, because those threads may still need to uh, load the m and n elements that are needed by others. So that's why the testing for doing Loading of the uh, input tiles may be different than the t t uh, testing of generating the output. Some of the threads will not participate in calculating the output, but they may actually still need to participate in the loading of the input because we changed the access pattern. Remember, we changed the access pattern to be able to do better memory correlation, right? So, so we're going to need to uh, test whether these threads are supposed to be participating in the loading or not. So in this case, you know what the, when we look at the phase one of block zero zero, we see that uh, when we load the, uh, you know, when, we, when we load the M tile, when we load the M tile, we need, we need to load two elements, you know, to M02 uh, and M12, into the uh, into the streaming multi uh, into the uh, shared memory, and then we need to load n two zero and n two one into the shared memory. So the threads that are needed to load the m elements and the threads that are needed to load the n elements are actually different. Okay, so this is the reason why I we always talk about this because a lot of people don't realize that when you Write your your kernel code. When you, the test that you need to do for loading the m elements, the test you need to do the n elements, and the test you need to do for calculating and writing the p elements are all different. Okay, so when we do the uh, you know the phase one calculation, once we you know we finish you know loading the streaming multiprocessor, we can do the first round, but the second round will have, you know potentially will be accessing garbage. So we need to make sure that uh, these, you know, these values do not cause harm. For dot product or inner product, we can fill zeros. We can put zeros into those locations and let all the you know, threads to still just do one more step, but those are zeros, so they're not gonna change the inner product value. We're gonna not accumulate any, you know, non uh, you know, any uh, va additional value into the inner product so we're okay. 
So that's why we're going to see that we're going to be you know, lo uh, loading zeros into the shear memory for the parts that correspond to the region outside the valid N and N you know, the, um, elements. Okay? So uh, for phase zero of uh, block one one, so we're generating this particular part, uh, block one one, we're generating these elements. We only need to generate one element. So theoretically, only one thread need to you know, process the P, generate the P element. However, we still will need to use two threads to load the M20 and M21. Okay, so those two threads still need to be active loading the N element, and two different threads need to be active loading the N elements. Okay, so that's why we you know, further it, uh, you know, illustrate why we need to have different tests. And you know, when we generate the final outcome, we need to you know, make sure that uh, these elements are filled with zeros so that we don't, uh, we don't produce incorrect values into the, uh, you know, into the elements. So these are the, the major cases in our example. Okay, so we already went you know, talk through these. So the, you know, when, uh, when you write your code, you should use this example to, you know, to, to think through your code. The best way to debug your code is actually to use these small examples and walk through your code before you go and run the code. Using debuggers, using any kind of debugger for massively parallel code is the last resort, okay? You don't want to even touch the, de the debugger unless you absolutely have nothing else that you can use. They are such a pain that uh, you know, once you use the debugger, it's equivalent to driving in LA traffic, okay? So you know, avoid it as much as you can, and if you know, absolutely necessary, that's when you start to go. So here's a simple solution. So we test if a thread is to load any input element else is outside uh, the valid range. If it's valid, we load the element. If it's not valid, we put a zero into the shared memory. Okay, so that's a simple. And now, uh, you know, we already talked about this. So we use zero so that uh, you know during the phase one, the phase one of generating these elements, we are now essentially accessing the n parts here and n parts here. And, but by put, putting zeros uh, in, into the uh, shared memory, we're able to, you know, what, uh, to be, uh, we're able to you know, avoid any incorrect addition to the values. So um, if a thread does not calculate the valid p element, we can still perform multiply add into the register as long as it's allowed to write, it's not allowed to write into the global memory. So for this, the calculation of the, uh, you know, the uh, block one one, which is the lower right corner, uh, as long as we can generate, we can still uh, generate values into the register. Remember that p value is in the register of the threads, as long as we don't write that into the memory. So this is the code that you're going to have once you correctly tested all the boundary conditions, okay? And um, so when we come into the phase, so we still have that M for loop, but before we load the M element, we are gonna see if the element, the row uh, is less than width, and then the, uh, and uh, so this row, um, uh, the, the row index that we're gonna be using here, we're gonna be using uh, to, uh, uh, the row index, and then the uh, M times the uh, uh, tile width plus tx, which is the column index. So uh, we're going to make sure that the column index is within the width, and also the row times, uh, you know, the uh, row is also less than the width, so that we can actually make sure that the m element that we're trying to load is inside the valid range. And we, we, we have the uh, linearized expression, but really it, this is the row index and this is the column index. So we, we're gonna test whether the row index and column index are within the width, right? So if it's not within the rate, width, then we do a uh, assignment of zero into the shared memory location, okay? So uh, we still need to do the sync threads. So the, that's still there. And then uh, for the calculation, uh, you know, this is actually optional, but uh, you know it's it's a good practice to do the if uh, test 
for the calculation as well, so that uh, we, uh, we don't do the calculation. But if you didn't do this one, it should be still okay. And then you do the sync, uh, sync thread. And then we have the, you know, uh, we, before we do the write, we make sure that the row index and the column index are within the valid range, so that we only write into the valid key elements. So these are the simple changes that you're going to make all the, the beyond the, uh, the basic, uh, the, the, the tile code that we have introduced last time, and this will give you complete checking. And you know, so you can handle any arbitrary uh, size, odd dimensions, and so on. Um, last semester, we did not have sufficient test cases in a web GPU, so uh, some students came back and said, hey, you know what, I have a few of these odd dimension matrices that actually worked. We went back and said, you're right. So we gave them extra credit for reporting, and then we add, beef up the test cases. So this semester, you have to do it right, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thanks to the students from last semester. So, uh, so you know what, uh, for each thread, conditions are different. So remember this, I, I harped on this multiple times. The conditions for loading in, loading in, and you know, writing into the uh, uh, output are all different conditions, okay? So that should give you everything, everything you need for MP3. Okay, so uh, we're a, a couple of minutes beyond, uh, you know, because I forgot to upload this set of slides uh, yesterday. Apologize for that. So the, for the Urbana campus, you know, uh, the uh, class is over, and uh, if you have any additional questions that uh, you know you want, uh, we can answer them on the piazza. And uh, uh, for the Chicago campus, we're going to go into a Kanghao meeting with uh, you know some further questions, and I would like to understand your status more. Okay, thank you.